So welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, alors nous, nous débutons, euh, cet automne, on a débuté une série d'ateliers pour les étudiants diplômés. Euh, dans le premier, on a parlé des demandes de subventions externes et pendant cette session aujourd'hui, on va parler de comment choisir, choisir ou trouver un superviseur. Um, alors, pour ceux qui ne me connaissent pas, je m'appelle Meredith uh, Rocky et j'ai commencé au département de communication en janvier 2020. Alors, ça fait même pas une année. Et présentement, je fais partie de, du comité des études de cycle supérieur. Et en travaillant avec Jennifer, qui est la présidente ou coprésidente, j'ai oublié maintenant officiellement, uh, du comité des étudiants diplômés dans notre département, on a décidé de créer une série d'ateliers pour essayer d'aider nos étudiants, euh, surtout dans la, comme au début de leur euh, carrière, disons, en tant qu'étudiants dans la maîtrise ou au doctorat. Um, so the goal really is to just kind of provide you with some opportunities to ask questions, uh, also to connect with other people outside of class um, and get to know different students and people in the department. Um, so today uh, we have myself as well as uh, Dr. Kyle Conway, who's here to kind of give the perspective of how to find a supervisor from the faculty side. But we also have some upper year graduate students. We have uh, Diane, I don't know if you want to wave. Yeah, so Diane, we have Alex uh, and Jen here as well to just kind of give the perspective from the other side. Um, so uh, the way we're going to do it today is I have a little bit of a presentation, kind of like a formal part on Um, just some, what you should be looking for in a supervisor, what is kind of like an excellent supervisor. Um, and then I guess I'll put, um, you know, I'll put the clause there that there are no, no one's perfect. So even if you look for this holy grail of a supervisor, you're not going to find this perfect person. Um, but there are some kind of things you should be looking for. And I think you need to kind of decide what's most important for you. Uh, then we're going to kind of open the floor. Uh, Jen is going to run a little bit of like a panel discussion with the upper year students we've invited to be here, as well as Kyle and myself to kind of ask questions. And then we're hoping to open the floor to you guys to get, you know, your questions answered. And then if at the end we still haven't answered everything, I have actually put in the slides some specific kind of tips and best practices for reaching out to finding your supervisor. So that is the goal today. Um, I was going to have everyone introduce themselves, but I'm wondering now with the recording, what do you think, Jen? I forgot about that. <laughs> um, I think maybe anyone that has a question could introduce themselves quickly when they ask a question. Um, okay. So we can jump right into the, um, to the workshop. Perfect. Okay, well, here we go. So, uh, comme j'ai mentionné, le plan aujourd'hui, c'est de vous parler un peu de, comme c'est quoi un excellent, or un superviseur excellent. Ensuite, on va passer aux tables rondes et à la fin, je vais vous euh, présenter avec quelques trucs ou meilleures pratiques pour trouver votre superviseur. So, in case you weren't, oh, and uh, by the way, I'm a really big fan of the Lego grad students. So, if you don't follow Lego grad student, uh, uh, if you haven't looked it up, I would highly recommend it. It's actually hilarious and very cute. Um, so basically, it, I felt as a grad student that it very much captured my experience. And if you look up all the little kind of comics they have on the relationship between Lego grad student and um, their uh, supervisor, it's a little bit hilarious. So anyway, there's, you're going to see Lego grad student today. Um, so your supervisor is going to be one of the most influential people in your academic life, especially if you end up staying with this person for a PhD uh, just beyond kind of that two years. Um, for the masters and throughout the course of your degree, your supervisor is going to play kind of the role of like your mentor, your confidant, your cheerleader and your advisor. And if you happen to pick someone who you don't mesh well with, they could also be your soul destroyer, um, the person who's responsible for your tears. Like there's a lot of ways that this can actually go poorly. Um, so it is important to kind of not take this choice lightly. Um, And they are going to play a key role in your success as a graduate student, uh, you know, and that speaks to kind of how quickly you're going to progress through the program, what the quality of your research looks like, and kind of what comes after. So it is an important decision. Um, and I've also joked uh, that I've known, um, I've had a longer relationship with my PhD advisor than I have with my husband. So uh, it is like, it, it's, a, it's a serious commitment. Uh, it is like an immediate long-term relationship. So it is something, I'm not trying to scare you, but I, I am just, I just want you to know that you should, you know, if you're nervous about making this choice or trying to find someone, it's, it's normal. It is, it's not a small decision, okay? So uh, that is normal. 
Okay, so if we're talking about excellent supervisors, what kind of should you be looking for and what could, should you expect from a supervisor? So when we're talking about a supervisor, they're going to provide guidance for you. Alors, quand on parle de conseil, on parle de conseil au niveau de la recherche. Alors, ils vont vous aider à déterminer comment vous allez faire votre recherche et sur quoi vous allez faire la recherche. Um, ils vont vous aider avec la planification, alors comment concevoir, mettre en place et réaliser votre projet dans un laps de temps comme, quand même euh, courte. Okay? Un, une maîtrise, c'est deux ans, un doctorat, c'est quatre ans. On s'attend que oui, ça peut prendre plus de temps, mais c'est quand même um, important du côté de votre superviseur qui vous encourage à compléter tous les critères pour votre programme dans ce délai de temps. Um, They should be helping you with, or they should be able to guide you on what actually comes out of your research. So whether this is like publications or books or whatever comes from your thesis, they should help you be able to turn or at least know where it should go kind of after it, you do the, the masters, like what happens next? How do you actually get this document into the hands of other people that could read it? And whether that's through kind of novel, like knowledge mobilization activities, like, I don't know, creating podcasts or putting things online or publishing it in more traditional means, um, your supervisor should have, you know, you can, you can count on them to help you, uh, guide you through that process and actually get that research out. Um, they should also help you acquire, or at least point you in the right direction about what skills you need to acquire in order to actually complete your project. So if you have to learn a new type of analysis, if, you know, they should be able to point you in that direction, or if you have to learn a new type of data collection, they, you know, ideally would be able to help you figure out kind of what skills you're missing and kind of help guide you in getting those skills. Um, and then finally, on the administrative side, okay, your supervisor, we don't expect them to kind of hold your hand and uh, know everything, but they should have a general understanding of what's required of your program. So for example, if you're in a PhD, they should sort of know at least what is involved in the comps or what is involved in actually completing that PhD so that you can work with them to figure out how to plan through it. So generally, um, your supervisor is someone who guides you. Um, they also should have a certain expertise. So these could, this could include knowledge, expert knowledge of the discipline that you're working in. So ideally, you would be picking a supervisor who's interested in some of the same topics as you. And you would hope that they have you know, more expertise in that field than you and can help you kind of make sure that your, your research you're doing is going to be novel and pertinent and it's gonna you know, be kind of future oriented in the sense that it'll make an important contribution and not just something that's been done you know, 100 times to people who know the field. Um, and then uh, this is something that's actually kind of funny about supervision is that um, despite what you might think, uh, professors don't actually receive any training in supervision and Kyle can probably back me up here. So the idea, the expectation is that you know how to supervise people but in no way in your training did you actually receive any formal training or feedback on how good of a supervisor you are. Um, so the assumption is that your supervisor that you will pick is knows how to train and teach you and that they're willing to transfer their knowledge to you. Um, however, the reality is that does not always happen in practice. Sometimes supervisors know a lot and they're not very good at kind of sharing that knowledge or helping their students gain that knowledge and learn from their expertise. Um, Your supervisor is also a source of support. So c'est quelqu'un qui va vous soutenir dans votre objectif d'obtenir votre diplôme, soit la maîtrise ou le doctorat. Um, ils ont un intérêt à vous voir réussir. Uh, c'est une personne que, sur qui vous pouvez avoir confiance et qui sera toujours à, à votre côté. Okay? Alors c'est quelqu'un que vous pouvez compter sur cette personne d'être là pour vous. Et un superviseur peut vous, euh, vous offrir du soutien dans comme trois domaines en général. Premièrement, c'est du soutien, soutien psychologique. Alors, euh, on s'attend que faire de la recherche, ça peut être frustrant de temps en temps. On, on peut euh, souvent être, on peut faire face à des, des, euh, des défis quand ça vient à la collecte des données ou trouver notre question de recherche. Et votre superviseur euh, peut vous aider, euh, ou devrait vous, vous supporter dans ce processus. Uh, votre superviseur peut aussi vous fournir avec des, de l'aide financière. Alors, ça, c'est pour vous appuyer financement pour euh, donner la, de, du financement pour faire votre recherche et vous aider comme un peu pour euh, 
réduire le stress relié euh, à votre situation financière. Et aussi, ils peuvent vous euh, fournir avec du soutien ou support pratique, um, dans le sens que si vous, avez besoin, si vous avez besoin de faire des connexions avec un certain euh, organisme pour faire de la recherche, ou si vous voulez faire du networking avec quelqu'un, votre superviseur peut vous aider avec ça. Ou si vous avez um, un problème avec le comité déontologique à l'université, ils peuvent vous aider à comme, naviguer un peu euh, ces problèmes ou défis quand vous allez les euh, confronter. And then, finally, uh, what you hope to be able to count on your supervisor for is regular interaction. Um, so this is having regular interaction and regular meetings with your supervisor is key to kind of making little things uh, stay little and not become big things or things that will detract you. Um, so there's two types of interactions that you hope you'll be able to have with your supervisor. So one are the kind of regular scheduled formal interactions. Um, so, you know, this is where you're going to be able to share ideas, get feedback, learn from them, et cetera. But you also hope to be able to have kind of these spontaneous interaction, interactions and encounters where you can, you know, be in touch. And this is especially hard right now with everything being online. Um, because before, for example, I could just walk by Kyle's office and he's always there. And now, <laughs> now he's not. <laughs> And I can't just, he's not there. So this is something that, you know, is going to be more awkward than it would normally be because we're not face-to-face -face on campus. Um, but having access to your supervisor kind of in that more spontaneous way, and I don't mean like needy, dependent, codependent way, but like, you know, just have being able, them being available when you need them kind of allows you to build that relationship, but also know it gives you the security of knowing that if something urgent comes up, you know that you can reach out and get that answer. Um, and I know that kind of early on in your degree, it is a bit awkward or weird because you may not know your supervisor as well. Um, but hopefully when you're picking someone, you want to be able to see that you're going to be able to develop that side of the relationship as well. So that kind of covers sort of best practices. I think once we actually engage in this panel discussion, though, you'll realize that no one's supervisor actually meets all of this. Um, and that you as a student are going to kind of have to kind of pick and choose like what your priorities are. Um, but the, this whole section here, I'm hoping, will at least form, inform things that you should be thinking about when trying to decide who you would pick and like what kind of supervisor uh, you want. So on, oh, sorry, I forgot I had one more. Never mind. <laughs> uh, they should also uh, help you uh, progress through the degree. Um, and I have a note here about they should be keeping you on track. So. This isn't a really, this can be contentious depending on how busy your supervisor is or what their supervision style is. You might hear stories of people that are waiting weeks, months to get feedback from their supervisor on a particular aspect of their research and that they're kind of at a roadblock and they're stuck. That is what you want to avoid. Okay, so your supervisor should not be in charge of telling you when to do things and how fast to move. That should come from you, but they should not be actively slowing you down in the sense that you're waiting on them for you know weeks, months in order to progress. So that is sort of the last piece. Okay, so now I'll pass it off to Jen. I don't know if we wanna close this and go to squares or, okay. So I will stop sharing. Sense. Okay. All right, so there. So I think now will be a good time for our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, so Meredith has already, uh, given an introduction, but if you'd like to introduce yourself again, um, perhaps specifying your area of research expertise, and then we'll proceed to Professor Conway, uh, Alex, and Diane, um, who are our panelists for today's uh, session. Great. Um, so like I said, uh, my name is Meredith. I started here in the department in um, January. So my research expertise is sort of on interpersonal communication and how it can promote motivation to engage in sort of difficult behaviors with most of it having focused on health and physical activity related behavior. So, um, so I've done a lot of work looking at kind of how we can use communication to improve uh, physical activity participation. Uh, and then more recently related to my teaching, I've started an entirely new stream of research looking at how people interpret and feel when they have statistics or have to learn about statistics. So this is like a passion project for me, wow. but Believe it or not, it's hard to find people who want to do that work. Uh, so, um, but this is kind of a new line of research that I've been working on that I do have funding to kind of support and look at, and I'm hoping to make uh, a big part of my stuff going forward. So, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, Professor Conway? 
So I'm Kyle Conway. Um, I've been here. I used to think of myself as one of the new people, but obviously I'm not. I've been here like five years. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't I don't know how that happened. Um, je reconnais peut-être la moitié des noms que je vois devant moi, mais c'est mes étudiants dans mon cours en français. Donc ça fait un peu étrange de m'adresser à vous en anglais. But I'll do that. And, you know, that's the one thing about the University of Ottawa. I can just switch languages, you know, au milieu de la phrase. It's, um, it's a great skill. So my research is, is largely, I'm, I'm in the humanities. Uh, my, my background is very much a humanities oriented background. I write about translation and border crossing in lots of different forms. Um, my first book was about translation between English and French and Canadian news. Um, right now I'm working on a book about the interactions between longtime residents and newcomers in Western North Dakota, which is where I'm from. Um, and uh, it's a, an area that underwent an oil boom from 2008 to, to, to 2014. And so increasingly my research has been moving toward environmental communication, which came as a bit of a surprise to me. I didn't know that that's what I was going to end up doing. Um, although I'm really curious, Meredith, to, sometime I want to talk to you about how people feel about statistics because this overlaps with, with uh, other things that I'm, I'm thinking about. Um, I came from a department in my PhD where we had no methods courses. And um, this is a very methods heavy department. And so I've been thinking a lot about the way that humanities scholars think about methods, but the question of how people feel when they're faced with statistics is in a very similar vein. And so, um, L'autre chose de savoir, c'est que j'étais le, le directeur des études supérieures pendant deux ans, et donc je connais assez bien le côté administratif du travail. Euh, c'est quelque chose... Bon, si vous avez des questions, je, je peux soit vous donner la réponse, soit euh, vous dire d'écrire à Sylvie Grosjean, qui est la directrice maintenant, et qui aura certainement la, la réponse. Mais c'est quelque chose que je connais assez bien aussi. That's it. C'est parfait. Merci, Kyle. Uh, Alex, would you like to go next? Uh, only if Diane doesn't want to go next. Oh, My good. mother raised me right. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, moi, uh, je suis étudiant de maîtrise. Uh, je rentre uh, en actualité dans ma troisième année. Um, alors, Meredith uh, a dit au début que d'habitude, ça prend deux ans. Et uh, oui, je suis sûr que c'est vrai, mais des fois, la vie uh, rentre, puis il y a d'autres uh, choses à dire. Um, alors, ça, ça a un bon, um, une bonne connexion à la, la conversation aujourd'hui parce que um, c'est vraiment avec le support d'un bon superviseur um, qui uh, ça va vous aider um, quand la vie entre dans, dans le scénario comme ça. Um, alors, um, Kyle is actually my supervisor. Um, so it's interesting here. Going to have like a little bit of a meta conversation <laughs> um, in front of the topic. Um, so that's neat. Um, but yeah, no, uh, long story short, I study signs, um, a particular moment at the beginning of when we interpret signs. Um, and uh, it sounds vague because it has been, <laughs> but it's getting less so because of Kyle. Um, so I, I look forward to talking to everyone about that. I feel like a meta conversation is quite appropriate from what I know of you, uh, <laughs> Alex, so that's great. Uh, Diane, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Oui, donc bonjour à tous uh, et toutes. Uh, moi, son, mon nom c'est Diane Riddell, je suis uh, une étudiante au doctorat, je suis candidate, je suis en troisième année présentement. Um, so I started in the fall of 2018. My supervisor is Luc Bonneville, who is a very busy person right now. Um, and my, my topic, I have a passion for looking at the lived experience of people who work in public relations or communications. I spent a long career doing that work. Um, so my passion is somewhat informed, I guess, by my own experience, but I'm trying to be more objective now as a researcher. Um, and my focus for my PhD is on the constant connectivity and techno stress of people who work in public relations and communications. And I'm actually gonna focus on people who've had high involvement in preparing COVID-19 communications. So this, this very intense period uh, that a lot of communications people are in right now if they focus in that, on that. 
Great. Uh, thank you, Diane. Uh, for anyone that I haven't met yet, my name is uh, Jennifer Dumoulin. As Meredith mentioned, I am the co-president slash president of the Communications Graduates Students Association, or the CGSA. Um, je suis un candidat dans mon cinquième année, alors aussi comme Alex et uh, Azik, um, suivant à la, à la um, mention de Meredith, it can take different timelines for different people to finish your degrees as you have different goals and ambitions and life um, events that pop up along the way. Um, I did my master's here in the Department of Communications many, many years ago. Um, it's hard to believe, but it happened. And uh, I've worked with Professor Mark Lowe's for my master's thesis, and I am working with Professor Florian Grandana uh, for my PhD dissertation. My master's thesis was in the field of political communication and the structural and procedural design of physical spaces. And my PhD dissertation is in the use of metaphors in science fiction and fantasy literature to talk about uh, kind of like Diane was saying, the lived experience of people that are um, living with uh, transmittable illnesses and diseases. Um, so that is uh, kind of everyone's introductions. Um, for anyone that is online, vous pouvez utiliser le chat pour uh, demander des questions. Um, et on aurait aussi une opportunité pour, où vous pouvez poser des questions um, avec vos vidéos ouvertes ou fermées. Um, but at the uh, moderator's discretion, I would like to ask the first question um, to all of the panelists today. And so um, as, a, as a note for the panelists, the students that are uh, online right now are current graduate students in the department who, for the most part, do not have a supervisor. Um, so this may be different than your experience. Some students come into the department with a supervisor and others find one once they've arrived for uh, different reasons. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea of where uh, many of the participants are at today. Um, my first question is, and this applies to all panelists kind of from both sides, um, how do you like to be approached as a potential supervisor or how did you approach your supervisor when you were looking for one? Um, okay, I actually had a look at this this morning because uh, I went back to look at my emails, my email correspondence from a few years ago to see um, who I approached and how. And um, in my case, I opened essentially with an email, I think. Um, I may have already had a conversation with Kyle, who may have suggested I look at certain people. That's about right. <laughs> uh, but, you know, Kyle, I don't know if you knew this, but at the time, you know, I was looking at programs both at Carleton and at University of Ottawa. And one of the reasons I decided to come to University of Ottawa was because I felt that the supervisor was a better match for me uh, than the one that had agreed to work with me at Carleton. So, um, that just kind of tells you how important match is in, in decision making. But yes, I sent an email uh, to, to Luc and uh, we arranged to have at first a, a telephone conversation and then some months later we met in person as well. So I'm, you know, firmly in the, the camp that had a supervisor uh, when I started or it looked like he would be my supervisor, that can always change. But, you know, when I applied, um, you know, and, and the, um, I guess, I don't know how far you want me to go into this, um, Jennifer, but I think one of the messages I would want to leave with you is it's really important that you feel that the supervisor that you select is a, is a match uh, in values, I think, and work ethic in a way, um, and that you know what it is that's important to you um, as you go into this discussion. Um, and some of that information may become apparent to you through your discussion with them. Some of the information might become apparent when you raise questions. So for me, one of the really important questions was uh, what elements is my supervisor hard on? So I really wanted to know, like, what are you going to be a real bear about? <laughs> and I asked, um, I asked Luke that question. I actually also asked people that he had supervised previously. Uh, and that's part of your research, actually, as you're looking into how do I pick a supervisor is get a sense of, um, you know, who is this person? Uh, what, what are their areas of research? Where have they published? Um, 
who have they worked with previously you know so i i did all of that i i actually made those phone calls to people so kind of like a bit of a sort of investigation but it's such an important relationship that it's worth your time uh, trying to figure that out. Thank you, Diane. Would it, anyone else like to chime in on that question? Oh, do we want to go student prof, student prof, <laughs> or do we want to do students first? Doesn't matter to me. I think since your mic is on, Alex, let's go for it. Why, right. don't, why don't you? Kyle's take is too, for the record. But let's go. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, <laughs> my uh, my process was um, a little bit more improvised, it sounds like, uh, than maybe Diane's was, um, as is probably typical from what I know of, of Diane and I's personalities. Um, so uh, I came into the program with this idea that um, I might be able to create some sort of taxonomy of all the media in the universe, right? I had this big pie in the sky idea that was super nebulous and literally impossible to implement, um, at least in, in, in any kind of limited timeline. Um, so my process in finding supervisors, yeah, Kyle laughs, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, that, yeah, he's not lying. Um, so yeah, the, the process for me was basically taking this idea um, which I should mention um, was sort of conceived with the idea of working with Dr. Pierre Lévy in mind, um, who was kind of like the, uh, the, the star at the top of the Christmas tree, if you would, in the department before he retired, the biggest name, um, and also tied into this work. Um, so he retired uh, the year that I started. So I was kind of out in the open, um, just swimming in the ocean. So I decided to take the idea and kind of run it into as many professors um, as I could, uh, because I think that when you pay for university, you pay for access more than anything, access to the journals and all these things that would just be way too expensive uh, to access on your own and access to the people, um, to the professors and to the other students. Um, so basically, if there was a human in an office I would kind of just knock on the door <laughs> and uh, introduce myself and start talking to them about this crazy idea and see where the conversation went. Um, Kyle happened to be the graduate chair. And so um, I kind of found myself just coming back to him to check in and, and ask questions about the process of finding a supervisor. Um, and those meetings sort of just turned into um, kind of nerd sessions, you know, uh, taking a look at this this puzzle, and uh, sort of refining my approach and and beginning to understand Kyle's approach to what happened to be a, a, a rather similar puzzle. Um, so yeah, it was it was very organic, but it was all about exposing um, my mind and my ideas to the to anyone in the department who would hear it, um, and just trying to work from there. Uh, in a way that sort of rewarded everyone. Kyle, I hope I've, I've added something to your last two years uh, going on. <laughs> so anyways. I, I'm, I'm amused, I think, to learn that I'm a replacement for Pierre Lévy in your, in your um, I mean, that's flattering. Uh, if I'm going to be sloppy seconds, at least it's, you know, Pierre Lévy is the first. It's... <laughs> Mais excuse, je voulais juste, je voulais juste uh, m'assurer, est-ce que tout le monde comprend l'anglais aussi? Oh my gosh, yeah, I'm sorry about Qu'est-ce qu'on a comme, comme groupe? Um, Peut-être que vous va... pouvez l'indiquer dans le chat si vous êtes bilingue ou si vous êtes plus confortable en français. Parce que oh. on, on est, on, nous sommes tous bilingues. Alors, on peut sûrement parler plus de français si le groupe euh, tend à être un peu plus francophone. Oui, Et alors... Okay. On, va, on va faire les deux aussi, d'ailleurs. On peut euh, alterner entre anglais et français. Um, si les questions sont posées en français, on peut répondre en français. Um, on peut toujours répéter de l'information, oui. soit en anglais ou français aussi. Um, il faut juste euh, que nous avons un, un signe que c'est nécessaire à faire. Et yeah, oui, oui, oui. oui. Ouais. excusez, mais j'avais juste remarqué qu'on avait répondu juste en anglais. Alors, je voulais juste m'assurer que, qu que tout le monde comprenait. <rire> <laughs> Excuse-moi, Kyle. <laughs> oh, c'est pas grave. Non, c'est uh, une des joies d'enseigner de, à l'Université d'Ottawa, c'est que, bon, tout est bilingue, mais tu dois être bilingue en même temps. C'est uh, une contrainte et c'est un avantage en même temps. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, to, re to respond to the question, I mean, students approach me in a, a wide variety of ways. There's this one guy once, like he talked to everybody first and then clearly, you know, I was the guy he settled on because it was convenient, uh, whatever. Um, no, I mean, des fois je reçois des courriels, on m'envoie des messages pour me demander si j'accepte des étudiants. Ce que je cherche quand je reçois un courriel comme ça, c'est je veux savoir que la personne me choisit parce que nous avons des intérêts en commun. Euh, des fois, c'est clair que quelqu'un m'a choisi parce que je réponds à des courriels. Et euh, ce n'est pas une bonne raison de, de choisir un superviseur. Uh, you know, so I'd much rather know that, that we have something in common, that they have an interest that's related to what I'm doing, um, mostly because I want to be sure that I can give them good feedback. I mean, if, if, if someone wanted to study interpersonal communication and they came to me, I'd say, I'm a very bad choice. I can't give you good feedback. Go talk to Meredith. She'll be much better. And that's not because I don't like a student, it's because I'd be a really terrible supervisor for that topic. Um, so that's, you know, I've, I've supervised two dozen students, I think, by this point. And the, the range of, of ways they've approached me, I mean, usually it's by email. Um, usually, or maybe we've taken a class, or they've taken one of my classes. Um, the main thing I want to know is, is you know, why, why me? Um, and I don't, that sounds, that sounds rather <laughs> egotistical, but what I really want to know is, you know, can I give this person good feedback? I, I, you know, I want to be, I want to be a responsible supervisor and mm -hmm. to be a responsible supervisor, I need to be sure that I have the skills that the student needs. So, and I guess, um, I guess what I could add, unfortunately in our department, we don't currently have a list of who's accepting students and who's not. So it is a bit of a crapshoot uh, where you're going to kind of knock on the door and it, you know, it's very possible that you could reach out to someone and it's actually a great fit, but they actually just don't have space. Um, so that that's one reality. Um, I'm not sure if Kyle can speak to this, but um, I get a lot of emails asking about supervision that are obviously like a form email. Okay, I don't know how yeah. to explain it. Yeah. Like it's, Dear professor, enter name, like fill in blank. I am student from, you know, this university. I saw that you do research on copy and pasted from the university website. Uh, I'm looking to start program like this next year. And it's just, it's very canned and it, I just ignore those. I don't even, yeah. I don't even respond to those. Um, so I think if you, since it sounds like, or no, it doesn't sound like, since the only option right now is to reach out by email, I think what you need to do is make it obvious when you are reaching out to someone that you've taken the time to do kind of some of that research. Unfortunately, what Alex did is not an option right now. Um, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> and so, you know, and talk about your ideas. Like, that's great. You know, I'm interested kind of in this. These are some of the ideas I have. But really in that email, you want to sell kind of what, what makes you unique and why am I actually interested in working in you and not anyone else? instead of, I just want to find someone. Like, I just need a warm body that's going to supervise me. Like that, that's, I guess, the problem. <laughs> so anyway, I feel like I was rambling. So the Student Association has some plans this year to help with finding students. Um, for the students that are on, or help with finding supervisors, for the students that are online currently, unfortunately, that system is not quite up and running just yet, but our goal is to um, do interviews, three to five minute interviews with faculty members that are currently part of our department um, that are able to supervise students, whether they have the actual space or not to do so. Um, and we're hoping to post those, um, that information online. And we're also <laughs> hoping to do uh, student bios on the other side so that you can search current students to, um, to find out who they're working with to kind of help facilitate both what uh, Alex and Diane were talking about as well as Meredith and Kyle. Um, so our goal is to help with that. I'm gonna plug if you're interested in getting involved with that, send us an email, let me know. Um, but they've suggested some fantastic strategies for finding a supervisor. Um, just to give you a bit of background for my master's program, when I applied, I'd actually planned on working with uh, Professor uh, Fernando Andat, who is no longer with the department. I believe he's down in Brazil right now doing research down there. Um, and I ended up switching uh, during my master's. So I had applied, I, I was uh, accepted. I took a summer class with Professor Andat, and then I took a class with Professor Lowe's, who I'd had during my undergrad. And he was the one that suggested that I do grad studies. And I was like, Mark, I'm too poor right now. I can't, but when I can, I will be back. Um, <laughs> 
Um, and after I took his class, he had graded one of my papers and, and I just knew um, based on his feedback and our previous relationship um, and the undergraduate level that I wanted to work with him. Um, so if you're coming into the program and you don't have a supervisor, it's not too late. Um, and I would say if you're online or you're watching this later and you're with a supervisor and you change your topic, that's also okay. Um, again, Meredith, Kyle, feel free to chime in from a faculty <laughs> perspective, but you're not locked into anything. Um, I just wouldn't recommend changing supervisors several times over the course of your degree. I think one thing that's really important to keep in mind is that the relationship between the student and the supervisor is a professional relationship, and it's driven by the interests of the student, ideally. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why, you know, if you change topics, that's, that's perfectly fine. I mean, if you change, if my student, if I have a student who finds that my style of, of work doesn't work for them, and they decide to change supervisors, that's a professional decision and not a, a personal decision. And it's one that I encourage my students, you know, like I, 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 I wouldn't be offended if, if someone decided that, that my supervision style didn't work because what they need to think about, student needs to think about first is their own career, their own goals. They're, they're the ones driving this. Um, and so, um, but the other thing that Jen says is also good. Like if you change your supervisor th three times, people will, the fourth time you're going to have a hard time. Someone, you won't find someone who will agree to, to be your fourth supervisor because changing supervisors that many times says as much about your style as it does about your, your uh, supervisors. So, but I mean, if, if you have to change, do, I mean, there, there are times where the relationships uh, don't work. Or, um, you know, I had friends in grad school who didn't finish their PhDs because the relationship with their supervisor was toxic. And this is something that, that you know, in this department we want to avoid and something that I personally want to avoid. So if, you know, if, if you find yourself in that situation, um, you know, take care of yourself, take care of your professional goals and your mental health. Mm -hmm. Alors peut-être on pourrait passer à une question reliée, euh, mais je pense que tous les, euh, tous les participants ont déjà touché sur ce sujet. Mais pour vous, quel est l'aspect le plus important de la relation entre un superviseur et un étudiant ou étudiante? Et comment est-ce que vous avez trouvé que ça c'était la, la partie la plus importante? So what was the, what's the most important aspect of the supervisor-supervisee relationship? And how did you figure out that that's the most important part. You've spoken about fit a little bit, but I'm wondering if you can expand on what you mean by that, just as an example. Um, I guess I can go. So I don't, I guess I should say full disclosure, I don't have a ton of experience supervising. Uh, so I'm probably actually the worst person in our department to be on this call and realizing now. Um, uh, whatever. Um, so I know for myself, like I, I'm a pretty social person. So I tend to really look for kind of that interpersonal um, connection and fit in that, like, you know, is this someone that I can spend a lot of time with? And if yes, then I'm willing to kind of look into, okay, what, what are the research interests? Are there overlap? You know, do, does this person have the skills I need to do the type of research I can supervise them in? And do I have the skills to help them be better at it? Um, so for example, if, if you want, like, I think the reality is, is if you want to do the work Kyle does, I can't supervise you in it. And if you want to do the work I do, Kyle can't supervise you in that. So like, we're, we're probably very far extremes in terms of kind of what skill sets and what types of questions we answer. Um, but I think for me, kind of making sure that that fit in terms of the interests of the student and their skill set and kind of generally what they want to do aligns with something that I actually have competence in helping them with. So that's, where I kind of go. But first I need to make sure that you're cool and that I like you, I'm sorry. It is, it, it is what it is. So uh, yeah, anyway, that's me. Um, yeah, just to, to add to that super quick, um, that was something that struck me too as, as someone who was very green um, when I came into the program uh, in terms of my exposure to academics, I was, I was very under read. Um, for my marks, you know, as one of those students who just kind of studied, did good, got the A minus, called it a day, right? Um, but that really exploring different supervisors and, and having conversations with different professors really showed me how nuanced um, the, I don't want to call them divisions, but the different 
sort of subfields in our department are. And so if you get an answer from a professor saying, no, that's just not related to what I'm doing, don't take that as like, um, I remember the first time I heard that, I almost took it as like, a, oh, well, that's kind of a selfish thing to say. Like you could, like I'm the student, right? You could learn what I'm doing and, and then it could be something that you know about, but no, it really is just by function of, of having to be that sort of specialized to be able to move the ball forward. Um, so don't be, don't be pushed back or set off by that response because it's actually a good one for you. It means you're not gonna waste your time with someone who doesn't have the expertise that you need. Yeah. And just to kind of jump on Alex's comment, like this is, I think he was kind of operating on the assumption that this, all of us have skill, we're skilled in supervising people and have extensive training in that. And the reality is, is that we don't. Um, and that Kyle, sure, he has a lot of experience, but never any kind of formal training in how to like actually supervise people. So then it oh. is not, it's not gonna go very well. Did I just jump? You did, yep. but I, we got you, we got you back. Oh, okay, perfect. So, okay. so for me, I mean, there were some very basic things that were, were super important to me and, and I knew I had found them uh, in the, so one of them was um, quick, quick response. So I didn't want to send a message and then wait a month to get an answer, like, um, because I know myself and I know what that, when that happens, I tend to go to a place where I go, okay, it's probably a bad answer or they didn't like what I sent or something like that. So I really needed that, that connectivity, I think, to, to be able to get feedback. I wanted a supervisor that was encouraging, someone who wasn't going to, you know, tear me apart um, every time. I think that was important to me, probably because of some experiences that I'd had in the workplace. But the most important thing I learned uh, to me was a supervisor who gives you good advice. Um, and this happened last year when I was, you know, working on the initial parts of my proposal, and I had come in thinking I want to extend the research I, I did in my master's, which was on the mental health and wellness of people in PR. And I remember there was a kind of a turning point conversation with Luke, where, you know, we, we had a conversation about what that scope was within the context of communications. And the fact was that it was probably difficult to tackle. And he kind of steered me slightly in a different direction and at, at first I wasn't sure what to think of that and you know there'll be moments like that in in um in your relationship sometime with the supervisor and what I did was I went out and talked to some people who I had a I had had a longer relationship with that I respected a lot and one of the things the most important thing that person said to me was you've got a smart supervisor because he knows the difference between doing the topic you want to do and doing a topic that'll get the job done and you know the point was the best PhD thesis is a done thesis <laughs> so you know it, it's um it was very instructive for me so in spite of the fact that you know there was all this positive stuff that was important to me about being encouraging and being responsive whatever the thing that in the end became most important to me and that was most um valuable was the fact that when the chips were down, he gave me the advice that I needed to get me in a zone that was gonna get me um, moving forward in a more constructive way, so. Great, uh, we've actually received a question in the chat from Owen. Uh, Owen's asked, how has your communication with your supervisor or supervisee changed during the pandemic? Do you primarily communicate through Zoom, email, telephone? Um, has it had an impact on, on that relationship? or those relationships so, if you're supervising multiple students. Alex, did you wanna go first? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm kind of in a unique situation right now. Um, well, not really unique, but um, kind of undesired in terms of how regular communication should go, but it's on me. Um, so the way that Kyle tends to supervise is to um, do some uh, managed negation I guess you could call it, <laughs> right? So um, if you come in with something that's just not gonna work, he's gonna tell you, but he's not really gonna, he'll, he'll kind of tell you sort of why, but he'll send you off to work on it on your own. Um, so basically I've been kind of working on my own right now. Um, but before that, to answer the question in the pandemic, 
um, we've been using email and these uh, Zoom meetings. Um, but prior to that, and something that um, I quite miss were uh, just office powwows um, to sort of talk about a, a book or some aspect of, of the problem that I was having difficulty with. Um, so ideally, you would be in some sort of shared physical space with the person um, conversing over coffee. Uh, but since the pandemic, this is the best we can do. And uh, we just acknowledge through the screens that we wish we could shake hands. Yeah, so very similarly, I mean, uh, Luke and I have a, a regularly scheduled meeting. Alors on se rencontre uh, chaque vendredi matin, uh, pas chaque vendredi, ou chaque deux semaines. Um, alors c'est toujours à la même heure. C'est toujours planifié. Euh, puis, euh, ce que je fais euh, pour l'aider, j'imagine, parce que je sais qu'il est tellement occupé, c'est que maintenant, je lui envoie des morceaux. Alors, je lui envoie jamais plus que six ou sept ou huit pages à la fois pour qu'on puisse discuter de ça. Euh, parce que je suis encore au stage de la proposition, alors ce n'est pas un document super long. Mais je lui amène toujours quelque chose. Alors, euh, tu sais, euh, sur Zoom, la conversation est beaucoup plus productive parce qu'on peut discuter du texte, on peut le mettre, euh, le partager euh, dans le shared screen. Euh, on peut se dire, OK, pour la prochaine fois, voici ce que je vais faire. Je trouve que ça fonctionne vraiment très bien. Euh, puis, euh, puis ça avance bien comme ça. Donc, So that's, that's essentially what we've been doing at this point. And obviously there's email in between if there are ever any questions or anything that he or I want to bring up. Just, uh, just pour ajouter à uh, ce que Diane a dit, um, quelque chose que j'ai appris pendant le processus, um, c'est vraiment utile d'utiliser le document um, comme une place de conversation, right? Comme tu dis, tu, tu montes la, le document sur l'écran puis vous travaillez ensemble. Um, mais je dirais qu'il y a certainement du temps pour des conversations plus euh, fluides et plus euh, euh, méta, on dirait, sur le problème, mais il y a aussi du temps euh, qu'il faut que ça soit phrase par phrase euh, parce qu'il y a des détails euh, qu'il faut vraiment que ça soit détaillé. <rire> il manque des mots en français des fois. Je n'ai pas la <rire> diversité linguistique que j'aime en anglais. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've found that working with people... Um... My style of working with students is the, uh, the exact opposite, apparently, of Luc Bonneville. I am not very good at meeting with my students regularly unless they have something to, do, you know, which is something I admire. I have a number of colleagues who are particularly good at this, and I'm not. Um, so usually everything is driven by, if students send me things, then I send responses, but I'm, I'm terrible at, I can't keep track of my own schedule, let alone someone else's, so I, I don't try. Um, Let's be fair, we arrived at that together. Oh, sure, sure, that's, yeah. That's the, re the relationship part of it. Mm -hmm. Like initially you try different things and maybe it works right away, maybe it doesn't. So we went through that period at first where, okay, how, do, how are we going to do this? And yeah, that's true. What well, and, we arrived at. And that comes back to the fit, I think, that you were talking mm -hmm. about. Um, and I, I chose not to answer that question. Um, the subject matter expert is, is kind of the first thing you can, as, as Meredith and Kyle have said, you have to kind of work with somebody that is in your field. Um, but once you get past that point, there usually is quite a bit of, of diversity in our department between who, between who you can pick and, and why you would want to work with them and why they would want to work with you. Um, and you know certain things about yourself as a supervisor and a supervisee. Um, someone like Luke, who is a fantastic professor and faculty member and supervisor, wouldn't work for me. I don't want check-ins every two weeks. Um, some weeks I get absolutely don't tell my supervisor. Florian, if you're watching this later, I'm very sorry. Um, <laughs> there are some weeks where I get zero done on my dissertation. And there are some weeks where I spend 40 hours a week working on it. And um, when I met with uh, Professor Grandana and when I met with Professor Lowe's before I worked with both of them, I explained that very clearly. I work outside of um, the university. Um, I teach part-time now. Um, when I did my master's, I was working full-time with the federal government. There's just things that happen in life that sometimes take all of your attention. And that means that I might not do anything. And so I really needed a supervisor 
that understood that about my personality um, and, and requiring a meeting every two weeks where I come back with certain documents. I'd rather have no meeting than have to go to them and be like, so I didn't do anything again um, because that wouldn't be helpful for me. But everybody- I feel like I need it. to clarify again. He doesn't <laughs> require that of me. I suggested that no, we no, no. that way at that day. No, I don't, I don't so think he anyone's- probably works differently. He probably works differently with other people um, but this is just the, what we, what we do at yeah. this stage of the process. I don't think anyone's being critical. I, I, I admire the people who have the ability to do that. I have actually done it with some students because it's what they need. But typically, I mean, with my supervisor back a while ago, um, once every six months, I'd knock on his door and I'm like, Hey, you know, I got a chapter for you. You want it? Yeah, that sounds good. And, and he'd read it and he would send me back like three sentences. He's like, I, I you know, it works. Um, that was, that was the extent of my interaction. It was funny to hear Meredith say that, you know, she's, she's known her supervisor longer than her husband. I haven't talked to my supervisor in a decade. I mean, he's a nice guy. I like him fine, but we just, you know, that was never, no, I, I just still never how we functioned. Yeah. Like, I, uh, was, was you have the advantage. My supervisor is somewhere in California. Yours, I, I presume is in social sciences. Yep. <laughs> so that would make, you know, if, if I were in, uh, Oh man, if I were in Santa Barbara, that'd be that'd be pretty sweet. He got a job yeah. in California. He decided he never wanted to live in a cold place again. Yeah. Um, well, and so what I'm hearing is that everybody's relationship is different. Not yeah, only, yeah. I mean, if I was working with Kyle and Alex was working with Kyle, our relationships would also yeah. be different. Yeah, How we work together would vary um, depending on the student's needs. And that's where the supervisor makes a decision about, I, again, I could be wrong, but you know, how do you adapt to different students? Yeah. How do you need to adapt to different like students? If, you, if you're someone who thrives with that autonomy, then great, pick a supervisor mm -hmm. who's gonna support that. And, and that worked for me in my PhD. I had a supervisor who I met with him, if he remembered, if I had something, he was great. We got along, it was great. He's become one of my really good friends, but I definitely, you know, if he didn't ask me any questions, I'd just kind of go as normal. And then when I started my postdoc, I got my first message from a supervisor being like, hey, where's this? And I was like, like what do you mean, where is this? Like, no one's ever asked me, it, it's terrifying. And that stressed me out. And it took me a while to get used to that. And I definitely, for me, preferred the like availability and social contact, but not the required like deadline submission, kind of what Jen was saying. Um, but I think you need to know your own learning style. And if you're the type that without that structure, you're going to be off floating in like a fairyland and never finish this, then that doesn't work for you. And like, you need to find someone who's going to hold you accountable uh, or at least help you hold yourself accountable. But, you know, but if that kind of rigidity gives you stress and makes you kind of not creative or whatever, then yeah, you need to find someone who supports that. <laughs> so we're almost at but, the one o'clock mark. I'm not sure if anyone has any additional questions in the chat. There's nothing that's come up. Um, since our last one, but I'm wondering if the panelists uh, would be willing to kind of give a final takeaway before Meredith puts up um, her slides from the session. Um, if I may start on this one, um, I have to go watch uh, my son here at one o'clock so that my lovely wife can do a job interview over Zoom. Oh. <laughs> um, so I'll be quick here. Um, I did write down three tips on the back of my chores to do list. Um, so the first one, this is obviously for students approaching supervisors. Um, if you can get into a conversation with them, so that being a Zoom room or an office conversation, whatever it is, um, these are tips for those conversations. Um, you want to leverage your naivete. Um, so as, <laughs> as <laughs> Kyle, yeah, you know where I'm going. Um, so as, as a rookie, you get you have wiggle room that people um, who are more refined in their abilities don't necessarily have in terms of ignoring the existing answers to big questions. Um, you can kind of look at problems in a way that someone who doesn't have some of the baggage of the field in their head um, might be able to look at them you know, and, and, and think outside of the box that way. And what I mean by leverage is you want to kind of make the prof jealous of that because they don't necessarily have that level of, of, uh, of, of jeu to, to, to use, right? Um, they have to, or they have to work much harder for it in, in the departments. Um, whereas you, the little green rookie can kind of just prance in and say things that, 
no, no self-respecting professional would say, but that are actually really insightful if you're lucky. Um, the next thing is, sorry, I'm taking too much time. Um, think about interesting things with your supervisor. Um, that goes back to just sharing ideas. Nexus your, your ideas together and uh, see what happens. And uh, the third one is make them laugh. These are humans too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Kyle and I always start with a couple of jokes and it just makes working together that much better, easier, more human, right? It's uh, humor is, is my tool for that. So that's my advice. Use your naivete, think about cool stuff, make people laugh. Thank you, Alex. I know you're going to be hopping off in about a minute and a half. So I want to say thank you to you for joining us um, today for this session um, before opening the floor for the other panelists to, to give their last last little piece here. No problem. Thanks for letting me uh, hear the sound of my own voice. It's always nice. <laughs> well, my advice is short, and that's just like keep in mind that uh, it's it's your, your uh, career and your choices and it's a professional relationship and that if you think of it that way then you have a much you can exert a lot more control over the process and i'm meeting a student in 30 seconds so i'm going to well i'll say thank you, to you as well kyle yeah. thank you very much for joining us today um it's been great to hear from you so so i would build on that by saying yes it is a relationship that we need to take an active role that's not always about how you know, our supervisor manages the relationship, but it can be about how we manage the relationship too. And the thing we didn't touch on that I would leave you with is remember that whoever your supervisor is, is probably gonna recommend who's on your committee as well. So that's really important too. Um, so, um, you know, get to know who they tend to work with and that kind of thing, because that could be helpful as well, um, because those people have certain research interests and areas too. Great. Thanks, Diane. Meredith, would you like to give any uh, last? Yeah, I guess, or... or I guess we can both kind of wrap it up. So I guess um, the first thing is, I know it's one o'clock, but uh, I'll just flip the slides back on. But if any of you want to stick around and ask kind of some specific questions to uh, Jen, Diane, or I about like who you're talking about, or like run some ideas by us, we can turn off the recording and have that conversation with you uh, since you're here. And we're happy to kind of you know, if you want some advice. Um, but I guess one of the things I did want to point out is like, this is a normal process um, and you don't want need to be nervous about it. I get that it can be intimidating to send an email asking for someone to essentially supervise you, but we know that you're in the program, you need a supervisor. So it's not like you're asking anything unreasonable. It's not really an awkward request. And so try not to, you know, make it too big of a thing and just take chances and reach out to people. Um, the other thing I did want to highlight is I have met a few new students that I am supervising and I've only met them on Zoom and I have felt like I've been able to build that rapport and get to know them. So even though it's not the same as being in person, I don't think that the quality is diminished that much by not being able to do that. So also don't worry about that maybe undermining the experience uh, this year. I think it's still very possible for you to meet someone good and kind of feel good about that relationship and get to know them, even if it's like this instead of in their office. So that's that. Um, maybe Jen, as you wanna give your notes, I'll just get the slides back up to go over the last tips. Sure, um, I would just uh, maybe second or fourth or fifth what all of the other panelists have said. Um, the relationship is an important one. Yours is going to be different than the students that have come before you. Um, it'll be different than the students that come after you. Um, and, and I think I often forget this. Um, our supervisors are people. Um, ils ont des vies, ils ont des émotions, ils ont des préoccupations aussi. Um, and, and, you know, they treat us like human beings and, and they are human beings. And so um, I think I, I found that um, a little bit of compassion works very well in both directions. I know um, some of the, my co-panelists um, have been talking about uh, feedback and deadlines and things like that. And, and your supervisors will ask things of you and you'll ask things of them. And it's important to be mindful of the, the deadlines and pressures that everybody is under. Um, but it's a, it's a fun relationship. And, and everyone is different. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'll just quickly share um, the last little bit here. So um, here. So just, these are some tips. Uh, these will be available. We'll send you the slides. Um, but if you haven't already started looking, uh, the communication department website is a good place to start. 
Juste à noter, c'est juste des profs à temps plein qui peuvent superviser des étudiants diplômés. So that's something that some people sometimes get disappointed about when they realize that this really amazing prof that they had in their undergrad or that they know about isn't actually available to supervise. However, if there is someone that you really want to work with and they don't have supervising capabilities, they probably might be able to co-supervise you. So if you can find someone to host you and then you can still also work with that person, uh, that is an option and something to discuss and explore. Um, another option is that um, I would highly recommend looking at your super potential supervisor's publications. Um, so you can see those, even if it's books, it'll be in the library. If, it's, uh, if they tend to publish in journals, it'll be on um, their Google Scholar profile. Uh, if they are, you know, if they're very active in like political communication or social media, they might also be posting a lot of stuff on their social media. And it's a good idea to get a sense of kind of what the work actually looks like because the description on the website is just something that, you know, oh, I'm just gonna draft that up quickly. And a lot of times people forget to update it. Um, but the actual publications are gonna give you kind of a sense of how this person writes, what their research actually looks like. Like, what would you be producing if you were to do research with this person? And I think if you're kind of having trouble deciding between a few people, looking at their work might actually make it more clear. Um, so for example, I always joke with Kyle about this, but I actually can't understand what he's writing about. So when I read his publications, I was like, I don't know what this is. So that's, that's just me though. And, you know, obviously that's, it's just that him and I are very different from research perspectives. So that's something to consider. Um, if you are gonna send out an email, uh, you know, make sure it's written personalized to the recipient. And I've just posted some here, like a little template that you can use about some ideas, um, as well as some guidelines about kind of when to follow up and when to just like consider it a dead horse. So I did some work on this and it seems to be like two weeks, it's reasonable to follow up. If no one follows, if they don't hear from them after two weeks then just like consider it done. Um, so we'll send these to you. We don't need to go over it in detail. Um, and then if you do actually get to meet with your supervisor, it's a really good idea to come with some questions uh, and, and um, questions for them. So things you might wanna ask them are like, what are the characteristics of a successful grad? I put PhD here but we can say uh, graduate student, what do you expect out of the students you supervise? What's your mentoring style? How are your past students doing? You know, how many current students are you supervising? That's an important question um, because they might be promising a lot of things, but if they have 27 students, then that is a red flag. Um, how much time would you have for me? Like these are all reasonable questions that could help you uh, have, kind of navigate that choice or, you know, make it. And it also shows that you're organized and that you've thought a lot about like, you know, what this could look like. Um, so yeah, and then, so we'll share this with you. Um, but like I said, if you want, we can turn off the recording and kind of run ideas by you or, or not. Like let, let me stop the recording now. Um, and then we'll <laughs> stay online if anybody would like to stay online. And if everyone's available to stay online, if other, yeah, that's the other obligation, assumption, yeah. the other assumption is mm -hmm. that, yes. And you can also uh, email the CGSA account. Um, I'll plug that email address in the chat box uh, one more time. We hold uh, informal sessions where you can talk to other students about their experience at the department, um, as well as formal sessions like today's meeting.